Ich meine, was nicht. How do you advise in terms of the balancing the power of the board of a theater, the power of the general manager of the theater and the artistic part? Mm. Because automatically there, there's an artistic part at one and there's an administrative responsible part at two people. That's two to one in my box. Well, the artistic director's got to lead. He's got to lead. He goes to the board and he argues his case for the plays and uh, the figures will be on the table and the board will look at them and say, well, you know, we lost some money last year, maybe you should be a bit cautious. What does caution mean? Does it mean doing more predictable plays? What does it mean doing more exciting plays? So you talk that through with the board and you try to persuade them to what you think the moment requires. Uh, what type of excitement the theatre requires, what entertainment means. Uh, it can mean many things to many people. Uh, and uh, you've got to be a good persuader. Yeah. And uh, a good uh, front person for your vision. You've got to be able to speak to it and persuade people. And uh, you have to grow. It's a very important thing. You have to keep growing as a artistic director. I hope I grew. I stayed in this job for 28 years. Most people only stay for five years. What was very helpful to me, I suppose, in that survival mode was the fact that the society in Montreal changed. We were confronted by the Anglophone community. It was challenged time and time again by the emergence of a very strong Francophone consciousness and culture. And this, this forced a reappraisal of who we were and what we were doing, why we were there, constantly and I think that saved me that gave me a new a new impetus every few years to to assess and to uh, yeah to understand my role better in because uh, I was going to say most artistic directors either move on after five or seven years or right. retire or you know or get kicked out yeah. or get kicked out but no uh, 28 20 years, years yeah so did you reinvent yourself or you said yes I think I did I think we did all to, yeah And uh, the staff played a big part in this, the people I had in, 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 in questioning and challenging and feeding and, and so on. If the, if the artistic director has a problem with the general manager and they start butting heads, what should the artistic director do? He should try and resolve it with the general manager or he should fire him. But does the artistic director have the power to fire the general manager? Well, he should be the one who appoints the general manager. Yes, absolutely. That's my that's my credo. Yeah, if you can't get on with the general manager. I don't know a board now that would allow an artistic director to appoint a general manager. Oh, really? Well, I better come back to Canada and start <laughs> doing some getting and, around. And similarly, if the artistic director gets in loggerheads with the board over vision or financial. Then they can fire them if they want to. Absolutely, that's their responsibility. They have the legal. Uh, they are employed. The board employs the artistic director. And if you end up with a board that is just not working or doesn't understand who you are, what you're trying to do as an artistic director, what do you, you do? try and change them subtly. You try and bring in to the board people who who will help. But you don't bring in lackeys. That would be pointless. The point of a board is to support in material terms, the work of the theatre. So you bring in people who have expertise in law, in accounting, and medicine, <laughs> in all different aspects of what you might need on a daily basis, you know, and they're the people who will help you and give you free legal advice and, 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 and help you reach into the community and always have a few businessmen. They are much better than professionals. Professionals are cautious. Businessmen are by nature entrepreneurs. They understand vision and ambition and change. So have a few of them on the board and uh, they help you reach out to, to the fundraising opportunities that may exist. But don't have, I don't have artists on the board. It's not a place for them to debate the program or anything. It's, it's, uh, I've there was served, a period in the 80s when there was a push to get artists. I know and I've served on a couple of boards and I felt myself to be entirely useless because it's not the place you can challenge an artistic director on what he's doing. It's embarrassing. They don't understand the nature of this debate that goes on between two people, two professionals. So, you know, 
it's 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 not the right place. It's not the it's, it's inappropriate. So uh, it's nice that the artistic director has a method of of getting feedback from the artistic community and is open to that. That's great. I think they need it for that process of development and artistic change and so on, but not on the board. Again, that's my credo. So just to continue the kind of administrative type, I want to go back to the artistic stuff later, but mm. the admin, you then moved on to PACT. Ah. Professional Association of Canadian Theatre. Yeah, and Canada. Was set up by... Well, Greg Pogey, I think, was the first, uh, first uh, director, chairman of the board. It is set up to deal with equity, to negotiate. This whole establishment of, 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 of theatres across the country needed to deal with equity. Equity had imported an American Broadway, New York contract. Uh, Canadian equity was just a branch of American equity for a few years and they were using a New York contract. And this was totally inappropriate to the reality of Canada where we had virtually no commercial theater. Everything was subsidized. It was a theater community, which New York knew nothing of, did not understand. But anyhow, we had, the, when Canadian Equity established itself as an independent organization, they continued to use that contract. And so for every three years, PACT has engaged with them to Canadianize, to humanize the contract of work in Canada. Which it's a great, Broadway, which great... The Broadway contract is in human? Absolutely. It was a confrontational thing. It was built on, 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 it was premised on confrontation. It was not premised on cooperation. And so that had to be wrestled into being over many years. It was painful and it was stupid. It should never, we should have started clean with a vision that was Canadian, not American. Wasted a lot of time doing that. And how long did, how long did it take to, through PAC, dealing with Canadian equity to actually get an a, a independent IPA agreement that would work? Oh, well, we had one that was working. It, uh, there were elements in it which I, I thought were still stupid leftovers. They took a long time to understand the nature of uh, non-equity theatre companies which needed freedom to find their feet before being locked into contractual terms. And uh, I remember them I remember uh, saying, leave this alone, you know, let it be for a number of years. But, you know, it abhors, equity abhors a vacuum. Where there is no equity, you rush in. It's, it's, it's a physical <laughs> law of physics almost. So uh, they needed restraining on many fronts uh, to allow uh, the Canadian theatre to find its shape before legislating it. And I, I don't know what the situation is now. I've been away for 10 years. But they seem to be functioning okay now. You know, well, they, uh, made, they made far more flexible content. I think so, yes. I think so, yeah. yeah, yeah. But, you know, there's, you one has to be careful because there's always producers who want to pay actors. Absolutely. Well. Oh, I'm not, an, I'm not uh, raising the flag for, for all the producers. They need an equity strongly. God, I wish we had an equity in South Africa. We don't have one. We have no actors' union in South Africa. There have been attempts to form them. They've failed. There's, uh, a, it, it follows from a whole history there. But So how do the actors work in South Africa? They work on personal negotiation, whatever you can negotiate personally. Wow. You, have some, you have some traditions of payment, but uh, no, nothing contractual. So is there any, uh, any larger protections for the actors in no. South Africa in terms of... Uh, no, there's, minimum the there's a minimum wage if you want to work at that level, which the government, right. for, for, for unskilled labor if you want to work. But uh, apart from that, no. But hours per week? Or no, what? nothing. You well, negotiate nothing. all that as per contract. Mm -mm. And you, uh, no, it's, it's, it's the Wild West there. And is that good? No, it's not good. We absolutely need a, a union. But there is no, but equally there's very little established theatre. There's very little, uh, the, 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 well, what happened is that in the past, during the apartheid years, there were these great edifices in each city of South Africa, Cape Town, Johannesburg, Durban, Brookfontein. 
and they dispensed the, the national grant and they had around them a pyramid of small activities, dance, theater, and so on. And uh, they were racially uh, d d exclusive. And so when the new government came in in 92, 94, it, it, it was a revenge. They, they cut the, the grants, the funding to these organizations by half. You mean the new government, you mean the ANC? Yeah, the democratic the government, yeah, yeah. yeah. So what happened is that uh, these, these big entities are now dispensed of all their creative activities, all the small companies that they supported, and they are now rental houses for big musicals and overseas shows. So we have very little now in the nature of producing houses. We have almost none. Uh, we have the Baxter in Cape Town, which is attached to the university. We have the Market Theatre in Johannesburg. But and they produce new work. So I'm not quite understanding, or is it like the NDP here in Canada, in that the ANC, all during the anti-apartheid years, the ANC was supported by a lot of artists. And yet when they come into power, they cut the money to artists. Is that what you're saying? No, they in fact took that money that they cut, that they, that they cut from the big theatres. They put it into a thing called the, the National Arts Council, which is similar to the Canada Council, and they dispend, dispensed many, many uh, grants, small grants to many people. And this, they thought, was democratic. To my mind, it is giving you just enough rope to hang yourself with. Because it's not enough money to take that product, that new play, beyond its initial stage of development. So artists will then run into debt. They will risk all at the fringe. And we lose generation after generation of talent that way. The situation in, in South Africa for the last 10 years has been tremendously wasteful of talent. It has also not allowed black theatre, which was marvellous during the anti-apartheid struggle. It produced marvellous works for that aesthetic to grow. They have no place for the, new, for the young directors, the young writers, the young actors to take their plays. So that form has been continued into a very predictable art form whereby they use issues now, it's pedantic, the plays deal with AIDS and violence in a predictable fashion. Again, because there are no theatrical establishments where a play can be tested and worked on for a year or two, things are rushed onto the stage with these small grants of money. And so we have a, an ad hoc situation in South Africa that is very wasteful. And my vision, and I'm now, I've been in South Africa for 10 years, and I've been running a trust there for seven, is to, is to build, take these community groups uh, and the most talented of them and grow them into a level of professionalism and self-sustainability. And this involves guaranteed funding over a certain number of years and involves intensive mentoring and training, uh, real hands-on stuff. The government is afraid to do that. It had, doesn't know how to do that. So it throws little sums of money over the fence to these community groups and says, well, you know, get on with it. But there's no supervision, there's no growth, there's no development. So my vision is to uh, try and get these, this, this, this type of national commitment to growth. And I've actually had a recent, a very hopefully productive meeting with the deputy minister, and she is supporting this vision. And now I've got to work through the, admin, through the bureaucrats.